We're all guilty of spending hours scrolling to find the best YouTube video just to fit in those old jeans or buff those biceps. But have you ever wondered why we do what we do? Why exercise became a widely accepted prescription for good health? Yeah, up till now, we don't really know the detailed mechanism why exercise is good for you. It is really hard to believe in something that doesn't show immediate benefits. We have great news for those who still went out for a run during lockdown or followed their New Year's fitness resolution. For those who didn't, today's episode with Dr. Lee from Harvard will give you a reason to get back to your schedule. Dr. Chi Hao Lee is a professor of molecular metabolism at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. We discuss his findings on an immune molecule that drives the metabolic benefits of endurance exercise. So let's dive in. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Science Rehashed, where we dive deep into recent scientific breakthrough in life sciences. I am Mehdi Jorfi. My name is Shen Ning. And we are your co-hosts for Science Rehashed. And today we wanted to make a very exciting announcement. We just initiated our Patreon account. Log into Patreon slash Science Rehashed and support our mission. Let's go back to Dr. Lee. Talking a little bit about the health advantages of exercise for metabolic diseases and cardiovascular health exercise can increase your cardiovascular function and increase your metabolic capacity. So for metabolic diseases, for example, I think every doctor will tell you exercise is the best drug to reduce your symptom or risk of metabolic disease. So. And conversely, we know that sedentary lifestyle or behaviors involving little or no physical activity are linked to higher incidence of diseases like cardiovascular disorders and also neurodegeneration and recently cancer. Right, exactly. And I think probably you are referring to sort of association with obesity and high risk for all the diseases that you, you mentioned. And I think for one, we all know obesity is sort of this imbalance between the energy intake and the consumption, right? So exercise for sure, it will increase the energy expenditure and so that way it can uh, prevent obesity. You will find a list of other benefits on the internet, but we are here to know why and how. Dr. Lee mentioned about energy intake and expenditure. For muscles, this energy comes from burning fuels like fatty acids and glucose from the processes called fatty acid oxidation and glycolysis. This requires a coordination between different organs, especially adipose tissue, liver, and muscles to supply muscles with enough energy reserves. And one key player within the cells is mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. You talked about muscle and energy. I want to dive into this one. And I think it's consistent between rodents and the humans, right? So if individuals who exercise at mild to moderate intensities, muscles use the fatty acid oxidation as a fuel, they prioritize fatty acids. Can you a little bit comment about the whole process, how this works, how they prioritize one fuel compared to another fuel? So this is actually a very fascinating human physiology. And like you say, it also applied to, you know, rodent and other animal is that when you start running, for example, uh, for the first 30 minutes, the muscle will try to burn glucose and the glucose is coming from glycogen that's stored in the muscle, right? And so, but right around about 30 minutes, there's a switch. The switch is trying to conserve glucose. So the liver produces glucose, start to produce glucose, and, but the glucose is not being used for muscle. Muscle somehow knows to convert the glucose to glycogen again and get stored. And at that, right at that point, the muscle switch to burn fatty acid. Right? So this is a very interesting human physiology. So why is this important? As you already mentioned, at the prolonged exercise, muscle needs a lot more energy, right? So burning fatty acids is a wise way to kind of, you can release a lot of fatty acid from the tissue. And that's what also make it 
good for exercise, right? So reduce the right. uh, fat accumulation of fat tissue. So it will burn fatty acid. And at the same time, you know, your cardiovascular system will increase the oxygen consumption, right? So that's also the reason why you increase your all lung and heart capacity, right? Because you need to inhale a lot of oxygen. Why? Because when you burn fatty acid in the mitochondria, you need oxygen to produce ATP, right? So it's a very coordinated effort to try to keep you run as long as possible. So why you stop running? It's not because you're running out of fatty acid. It is when your mitochondria is saturated, capacity is saturated, it cannot burn any more fatty acid. At that point, then the muscle turn back to burn glucose. Now using glucose produce lactate. So the preserved glycogen is really the last resort to tell your body you, you had to stop at some point, right? And once the glycogen being released through glucose produce lactate, and there's a term called lactate threshold. So this is actually the lactate concentration in your blood that tell the brain you have to stop, you cannot keep on going. So it's very interesting. And this lactate is the same molecule that gives you muscle cramps or burning sensation in the muscle after an excessive workout. It is really fascinating how our body has evolved to efficiently use its fuels. Indeed, many of the beneficial effects of exercise come from the activation of metabolism that promotes healthy systemic energy homeostasis. So next, we were curious to know how the body switches between those fuels. One way to explain the metabolic benefit of exercise, people believe it, is from the cytokine produced by the muscle during you know, exercise. Our paper tried to address that IL-13 or interleukin-13 is part of this reprogramming right at that junction of switching from you know, glycolytic metabolism to oxalic metabolism. Oh, so that's kind of the, if you talk about big picture, that's what uh, we try to accomplish. IL-13, which is short for interleukin-13, is a type of cytokine or a molecule secreted by immune cells into the blood, which will signal other cells to prioritize fatty acid oxidation over glucose breakdown during endurance exercise. In fact, when they compared a panel of cytokine profiles from the plasma of different groups of people, which included endurance trained people, obese and normal weight, sedentary men and women separately, they found that endurance exercise increased circulating IL-13 levels. The endurance trained group included women who performed more than one hour of aerobic exercise at least four times a week and men who were football players and runners. One way to study the IL-13's function in the body and one of the very common ways used by scientists all around the world is knocking out the gene or deleting the gene in animal models and see its effects. Dr. Lee used the same animal model by deleting or knocking out IL-13 and studying the function. When we studied IL-13 knockout mice, uh, we realized there's a defect in metabolism because we study people's tissue homeostasis but in that study we realized that there is also a defect in the muscle and so it took for a few years to kind of figure out what exactly in the phenotype meant at the time when you do the endurance exercise over time your muscle builds up more mitochondria right because to prepare for the ability to run longer and longer right so you can train your muscle to be able to to do a better job when you do the running and you know the marathon runner they all train and you know you can make your muscle to be more enriched in mitochondria so that in increase in mitochondria content in the muscle is also dependent on IL-13 when we delete this gene in mice you train an animal in water animal you see increased mitochondria content and that didn't happen in the IL-13 knockout animal and is this consistent with what you see in human Yes, I think the, the only, only point that people debating, uh, we talk about sort of different muscle type, right? And you have the type 1 muscle, a sort of, you know, reddish muscle that is meant for the endurance exercise. And you have the type 2 muscle that's, you know, good for the very quick act, action, uh, activity. 
there are people believe when you train your muscle, you can make the switch from type type two to type one. You can you can make that switch, but you know other people don't believe that's the case. But it's more like it just increases the mitochondria in in all the muscle type. But how does the cell know what to do when IL thirteen is detected? IL thirteen is a cytokine is in the circulation. So for the IL thirteen or any cytokine to be able to function, it has to engage with the membrane receptor, which is the IL thirteen receptor alpha one. IL thirteen receptor alpha one is expressed highly in the liver, in the muscle, and then in the pre lymphocyte before the lymphocyte differentiate to fat cells and the gut. Uh, among other body cells, right? So it, it kind of tells you that uh, maybe, you know, that one of the primary functions of the cytokine is actually to regulate metabolism in cells other than immune cells. I'm not saying it's not important for immune cells, I'm just saying it has also this other function, right? Uh, the receptor is expressed uh, in muscle, transduce the, the signal you need the downstream molecule. So C3 is one of the downstream effector that we describe. And another effector that we didn't kind of talk about in the paper is the other signaling pathway called IRS1 and AKT pathway. Uh, but we, we, we should just focus on the C3 here. So what it does is that the receptor can activate C3, which is in the cytosol, and what's being phosphorylated by the receptor they can go to it into the nucleus. It's a transcription factor, correct? Correct, yeah. So while IL-13 signals from outside the cells, SAT3 is an intracellular molecule required to transduce that signal to other molecules that will bring about the downstream beneficial effects of IL-13. important aspect of this paper I'm completely fascinated about and I want the listeners to know is the importance of communication between the different cell types in the skeletal muscle tissue. While skeletal muscle tissue is composed of stem cells, immune cells, and many more, this complexity is often overlooked. So what do you think about that, Mehdi? Indeed, I want to come back to the point where Dr. Lee mentioned that IL-13 is an immune molecule that might primarily have a metabolic function. Way back in probably in 2005, 2006, around the time when the so-called immunometabolism kind of, you know, started. And initially it's, it's how immune system affect metabolism. Now immunometabolism is a different term. It's like immune cell metabolism as we know it now, right? At the time, we, we found that IL-13 is a THC cytokine, has beneficial effect in sort of polarizing the microbiome within the white adipose tissue. As you probably know, white adipose tissue, now we know is a reservoir for a variety of different immune cells. And they are very dynamic, and each type of immune cell or the ratio of different immune cells can have a very different metabolic outcome for the deposit tissue and actually the whole body, right? So from there, we found that a deposit tissue actually is enriched in IL-13. We did not know where IL-13 is coming from. And right after that, there is like four or five paper published identification of this new type of cell called type 2 innate lymphoid cells or ILC2 cells. So what's interesting about these cells is that the innate lymphoid cell, right? So if you think about lymphocyte, you think about adaptive immune response, but this mm -hmm. new cell, the innate, uh, but the lymphoid cells, right? And the unique about these cells, they produce IL-13 and another cytokine, IL-5, uh, which is required for or important for eosinophil, and another different uh, immune cell that can produce IL-4, another kitchen cytokine. So there is very active research following those identification of the new cell. And the take home message is that these cells are reside in tissue and they can produce IL-13 in response to different sort of challenges, including parasite infection. Their findings show that ILC2 cells in the mouse skeletal muscle tissue increased in response to endurance exercise. And this may be the source of IL-13. So I really like this discussion kind of towards end regarding the host co-evolution with helmets, so worms essentially, right, parasites, and how IL-13 has evolved 
in a way, perhaps in response to it. So could you comment on that and your thoughts about how that came about? The study of IL-13 and the IL-13 producing cell, IL-C2, that people started to think about what it means by coevolution between parasite and human. And you know, this is still, the, the parasite is still pretty common in wild animal, right? So it must provide some beneficial effect. And knowing what we know about cytokinic IL-13 does, it probably does make sense it may help human. So one function that we didn't talk about is IL-13, IL-C2. They can also promote this you know, so-called browning of white tissue or beige cell recovery. Right, so the beige cell is a type of adipocyte that burn fat rather than store fat, right? And it can burn fat to produce heat. And we describe in our setting promote exercise induce a minimal benefit, including running capacity. There's sort of speculation, you can never prove that is for the human to migrate out of Africa. Again, this is not my own idea, right? So the parasite and this type of immunity may play a role in for the human to be able to produce, you know, heat, to be able to have endurance, kind of migrate out of the different uh, continent of the Earth. You know, it's, it's interesting to think about. In short, the metabolic benefits gained during exercise may actually be the byproduct of the immune response to the increased metabolic burden due to ILC2 and IL-13 during parasitic infection. Knowing these benefits of IL-13 molecule, can we just take a drug that increases IL-13 and not exercise at all? <laughs> For one, you're not going to use IL-13 as a drug because it has other, other effects, including causing some other allergy response like asthma, right? But what we're looking at in it is the a locally produced IL-13 and very small increase in the circulation, that kind of response, rather than when you asthma attack or you have a parasite infection, you get, you know, thousand fold increase in the blood. So that's a pathological versus physiological con- con- condition, right? So you, you can use IL-13 as a drug, you cannot use the 3 as a drug, right? So then, then what? what? What is the implication of, of this, right? So from my point of view, though, this is kind of the beginning. We're trying to start understand that the test way, as I mentioned earlier, we know exercise is good, but we don't really know the detail why it's good. And this is a, this is a coordinated effect. It's not just muscle, you know, your lung, your heart and brain and you know, liver or people's tissue all involved, right? So I think this is the beginning to understand how the coordination is regulated and the hope is to be able to find a suitable dot target down the road that will be drugable. And like I said, we only described the step three part. We haven't described the IRS and AKD in, in other signal and test way in other aspects of muscle physiology, right? So hopefully this is the beginning of you know, research. So is there one answer to know how much endurance exercise I should do to induce IL-13? It's a difficult question to answer. I think it depends on individual, right? So, you know, and another thing we didn't touch upon is the so-called VO2 max, right? The maximum oxygen consumption rate that one can have. So there is a measurement for that. If you go to a clinic, you can measure your VO2 max, and that will tell you your endurance capacity because it was we talked about earlier, how much oxygen you can take in and utilize is important for the muscle to can keep on going, right? So VO2 max is different for each person. Even though one answer doesn't fit everyone, American Heart Association recommends that for an adult, 30 minutes a day, five days a week, is an easy goal to remember for endurance training like swimming, running, skiing, and biking. Dr. Lee says that this study may not be easily extended to other forms of exercise like yoga or flexibility training since it's difficult to measure those than to quantify a treadmill run. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for this fascinating discussion today. Today's discussion of your novel findings has changed the way I think about endurance exercise. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was a wonderful discussion. And I think I should probably take a run around Charles River today to get to work and release my L13. Thank you, everyone, for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. Thank you to Dr. Rudy Tenzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter 
You can also visit our website at sciencerehash.com. We would also like to thank all the members of Science Rehash who contributed their time in making Science Rehash possible. This includes our writers, Madura Lolikar and Kara Brenner, our marketing director, Carla Diavanzo, our sound editors, Tavi Pollard, Jared Warsaw, and Sophia Nastri, our assistant, Rebecca Solison, our creative director, Emma Brand, our producer, Shuang Zeng, and our business development director, Vichy Lo. Our show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please subscribe and recommend our podcast to your friends and send us your comments and feedback. Thanks for listening.